Hello and welcome back to Preventing Prevent Cambridge, our student-led campaign against the government's ineffective, racist and repressive counter-extremism policy. This series of interviews is intended to explore prevent and the issues that it's a symptom of and contributes to, including Islamophobia, authoritarianism and securitization. This episode, I'm delighted to have on Sahema Manzura Khan, a former Cambridge student who studied history at Queen's College. She's written a collection of poetry called Post-Colonial Banter and has co-authored an anthology entitled A Fly Girl's Guide to University, Being a Woman of Colour at Cambridge and Other Institutions of Power and Elitism. Recently, she contributed essays to the book I Refuse to Condemn, Resisting Racism in Times of National Security and Cut from the Same Cloth, Muslim Women on Life in Britain. Sohema has also been commissioned to write plays Theatre Uncut and the Royal Court, and she hosts the Breaking Binaries podcast. She's currently a visiting research fellow in the School of Geography at Queen Mary University. Sohema, thank you so much for coming on. So happy to be here and very excited for this conversation. Thank you. It's great. Your spoken, your spoken word performance, This Is Not A Humanising Poem, which went viral a few years ago, has received 120,000 views on YouTube. I just checked today. It's about resisting the compulsion for Muslims to have to humanise themselves and try and show that they're normal and just like everyone else. And I think it's an excellent work of art. Uh, my favourite line is when you say, if you need me to prove my humanity, I'm not the one that's not human. So what is the story behind this poem? What inspired you to write it? Yeah, so this poem is actually from 2017. And it, uh, I actually wrote it the week after the London Bridge attack. So that was when, I can't remember how many people um, were hurt or killed, but London Bridge, that there was an attack that was labelled a terrorist attack, of course, because the perpetrators were Muslim. And it was during Ramadan, which was also interesting. So I was living in London for that year, studying. And it just was very palpable. I remember coming out of the mosque that evening and getting a text from my mum. And, and I say this in the poem, and she'd sort of said, you know, I don't know if you've seen the news, but be careful on your way home. And I had that in the back of my mind and this, this thought process of kind of, obviously something's happened that puts me, somehow puts my safety at risk, which is a really, I think, interesting position to be in when something like that happens. Um, and, and, it, and it raises a lot of questions, right, about why, why that's one of the repercussions that you have to think about. Um, and secondary to that was that I was a part of this poetry slam that was going on that week. I needed a poem and it kind of felt like, you know, I'm going to be standing on this stage as a visibly Muslim woman. It feels like it would be difficult to not talk about this kind of elephant in the room. But what happened was that every time I tried to write the poem, I was writing, what I found was that I was writing an apology. I was writing this, I was writing a humanizing poem, basically, you know, I kept writing about, um, kids that I grew up with and how you know they were funny and they were nuanced and they were multifaceted and I just kept circling back to kind of how why is this poem that I'm trying to write in response to the feelings that I have and I think that process actually really helped me clarify that what I was experiencing was this pressure where somehow in the wake of this act of violence my humanity has become conditional upon me proving that I um, unlike those Muslims and uh, you know the kind of what we can take from that and that feeling and that kind of conditionality is that actually it revealed to me that Muslims in general are viewed as a norm as suspicious criminal violent and so you're then put in this position that if you don't kind of um, distance yourself from those tropes you'll be treated with surveillance you'll be treated with criminalization you'll be and I think I was so frustrated by that, right? Because it puts you in such a, that's such an awful position to put anybody in, particularly young people and children and people who are just becoming aware of their identities in the world. And so the, the poem that I ended up writing was one in which I actually said, you know, this is what I've realized in the process of writing this. And it was quite meta in that way, but I think people actually did understand in that line that you've quoted there that, you know, if you need me to prove my humanity, I'm not the one that's not human. I think that's the kind of revelation that for me was, was really jarring and it was one where I kind of realized that so much of, I think as, as Muslims in this country, so much of what we internalize growing up is that actually we have to constantly prove that we're tolerable, that our religiosity is not too zealous, that our kind of faith system is not too extreme at every level. And this isn't just ideological, right? This is like within school, you need to prove and perform a type of Muslimness that won't 
you know, lead you being reported to prevent. You need to, at the border, prove and perform a type of Muslim list that won't see you stop from the Schedule 7. And it's, and it's everywhere and it's repeated. And so I think that pressure I felt in that poem is, is also instituted within the system. It's, you know, it's like within policies and systems. So, yeah, that is where the poem came from. And I think it, yeah, I think it was a poem that really helped me also re realise the kind of ideological coercion that I think lots of us are under in this country as well and in the West more generally. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wonder if you could talk some more just on the back of what you're saying about coercion, of the idea of condemnation um, and the compulsion uh, that's placed on Muslims to condemn. So why do you think, because of course you contributed an essay to the book, uh, I refuse to condemn, why do you think Muslims should refuse to condemn actions carried out by other Muslims? Yeah, so the, the book and the kind of ethos is, you know, I'm sure anyone watching this will be very aware that any time an act of violence is perpetrated by Muslims, on whether you're on a news channel, whether you're in your college, whether wherever you are, you'll be faced with the question of, you know, well, do you, you know, do you agree with what they did? Or like, do you want to say that you don't agree? You know, there's this kind of moment where you have to condemn, basically. And the reason I believe that Muslims should refuse to condemn is that in that moment of being asked, do you condemn or do you not? There is so much that is happening. So one thing that I often say is that, you know, when um, a mass murder um, is perpetrated by a white man in America, which happens oftentimes, right? Nobody says, you know, all the white people need to stand up and now kind of distance themselves from this violence. And the reason for that is interesting, right? It's because we understand that violence to have complicated context circumstances to it we individualize it oftentimes and we're unwilling to kind of extrapolate that onto all white people in the case of muslims the reason i think we should therefore refuse to condemn is a that obviously it's just a very ba a base level it's just racist generalization it's a stereotype but secondary to that in that stereotype being enforced again and again we're actually being asked to deliberately avoid what the root causes of violence are so instead of saying it's not really about whether or not I condemn, because that's so irrelevant, right? That's actually completely irrelevant. And the question is, what is the root cause of that violence? And asking me to condemn, you're presuming it's Muslimness itself, that this racial essence of being Muslim is the cause. And instead, of in, you know, throughout the book, what we're saying is that in refusing to condemn, we're actually raising a whole host of other questions about what it means to live in a violent system, what it means to live in a world still shaped by colonialism and capitalism. And so I think so much of that refusal it is a refusal to concede a to you know a coercive racist situation but b also to raise those questions and i think that that's something i do urge everyone to do and it, and it is difficult because i think the pressure is so suffocating almost because in not ref sorry in refusing to condemn you do you kind of place yourself in this position where you can be read and framed as you know, a bad Muslim, extremism aligned, a terrorist apologist, all these things. But actually, I think it's the work of asking what those terms do that is, is, is more fruitful for the type of direction we want to move our world into. Now, that's really interesting, because I suppose the compulsion condemn puts Muslims in a situation where we're guilty until proven innocent. And of course, that's the essence of prevent is no one is innocent. Everyone's a potential uh, criminal. And exactly. some people are more potential, uh, more, more likely to be a criminal than others. Um, and I'm just thinking another great poem of yours is it has a very related theme, um, but you also touch on some different ideas and it's called British values. And you articulate how elite discourse surrounding Muslims and multiculturalism seeks to pre present Muslims as other, and in doing so, denies fundamental realities about Britain. And one great line in the poem is, I am the inside, you pretend is outside. Mm. I really like that because I think it encapsulates it so well. Uh, the title of the poem, British Values, though, really interests me because I think you're referencing the language of the prevent agenda and the defining of extremism as being opposition to British values. And the implication to that is that certain communities are not completely British. So how do you think the discourse of British values pushed by the government has affected the treatment of British Muslims in recent years? Really good question. I mean, so for anybody listening, British values are defined by the government as not only, you know, if you oppose them, you're an extremist, but 
there, there's such ambiguous <laughs> things such as toleration, um, supporting rule of law, um, other kind of like just ambiguous phrases that any kind of liberal democracy would like to suggest that they adhere to and in the first place the reason I wrote that poem is that you know Brit the British state itself violates every one of these so-called British values at every level so we just go with rule of law you know we look at things like Guantanamo Bay we look at things like the use of secret evidence within courts we look at the use of deportation of citizen uh, of citizenship removal all these kinds of places where the law actually becomes very you know a tool for coercion a tool for oppression so part of it um sorry i'm just gonna say can you hear that is that really loud in the background since my neighbor's drilling i can hear it slightly but it's fine we can still hear you is it okay for the recording yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's fine yeah <laughs> okay sorry um so yeah in the first place it's kind of just pointing out that british values are clearly just a, a fabricated set of ideas that are used not because we actually care about them. And that's why I'm kind of highlighting that the state at every level um, violates these principles. But, but more importantly, that actually, I think so much of the way that Muslims are constructed in this country is really about constructing Britain in, in imagining Britain in a certain way. And this has been the project since colonialism, right? That actually, the, Edward Said writes about this in Orientalism, right? That so much of the ways that the East and the other and Muslims are spoken about is actually much more about defining the West. I think we see that today, right, when we hear every day that Muslims are not only violent, but they're barbarians, they're misogynists, and all of the kind of the things that were ascribed with it, I think, just put us in a position where we become the foil to Britain. So as a result of Muslims being misogynists and extremists, Britain can say that it's, you know, uh, feminist and liberal and, you know, open, whilst at the same time doing all those things that repress and, and, and harm um, those within and outside it. And so the impact on, I think that's what you asked me, right? What's the impact of this discourse on Muslims? I think, I think, I guess it's maybe twofold. Like, I think we do to some degree internalize some of these narratives. And I think that's really harmful because it leads to what I would say is quite a fruitless endeavor of trying again and again to prove that we are really British. And the reason I say that that's fruitless is that, you know, I don't, I don't see what the outcome of that is. In proving that we're really British, very little can come of that. Um, and in fact, I think it's a distraction from, you know, as Tony Morrison says, racism often is a distraction. It's a distraction from the more important work, I would say, of resisting actually what that narrative does, what the narrative allows for. Um, but the other impact on Muslims is just that, you know, <laughs> we're put in these positions where again and again, we're asked to integrate, we're asked to assimilate, we're asked to do all of these things, which at the same time, we're unable to do because of legislature and discourse which constantly others us which says assimilate but also we will never accept you as being British integrate but your citizenship will always be in question and so I think it just puts us at this crossroads where you're living like an oxymoron you can't actually do what the state's asking you to do because the state itself is preventing you from doing it so I don't know I'm sure there's much more that we could kind of unpack about that discourse but but in general I think it's yeah, I mean, I guess one thing to add is just exactly what you said, that with that then being the definition of, uh, sorry, the opposition to British values then being the definition of what extremism is, as a default, Muslim, Muslim, again, as you said earlier, all Muslims then are already within the bracket of extremism. We already fall within that because if we're placed outside of Britishness, if we're deemed to be not British, then where else are we, let, you know, we're just left with, again, being generalised and, and um, ascribed with, with the thing that then makes it okay to criminalize us, to surveil us, et cetera, et cetera. How would you differentiate uh, integration from assimilation? Actually, do, so I think like in literature and in different places, we can, we can differentiate and historically we can differentiate between these two discourses. But I would actually say today, there's very little difference, right? I would say that when we talk about, when the government talks about integration, you can read um, Louise Casey's review into social integration. I think it's from 2017. And what she talks about in this review is that the, the biggest barrier to social integration in the UK is communities where she, you know, she uses all of this racialized loaded language, which basically says that a Bangladeshi and Pakistani people in particular, which obviously in this country, we just ascribe with being all Muslims. So Muslims, in other words, are, you know, a the block in this country to us living in an integrated society. And she points out, you know, all sorts of strange things that are, again, all loaded. But fundamentally, what I, what I take from that is that actually 
there is no real difference within British discourse around assimilation and integration because one of the um, I think in both cases it's, it's, it's the racial other being asked to completely change and alter in order to fit a set of ideas or a set of tropes that 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 the state and the government have about them um, and one of the things that's actually really interesting in that particular report sorry to go on a slight tangent here is that she says that in areas where there were high concentrations of ethnic minorities, whether that's residential areas or schools, people are less likely to develop British values. And what she doesn't say is that in areas with high concentrations of white people, white residential areas or whatever, people are less likely to develop those values. So what you're left with then is the insinuation that white people are inherently born with British values within them and people of color are not and they need to learn them. And so as a result, I think that kind of comes back to this question of integration and assimilation. We, in either discourse, racialized people are placed outside of the whole, the nation, whatever, and they're asked to basically rid themselves of what it is that makes them racialized in order to become integrated, assimilated, whole. So I, I don't see that much of a difference in the way the language is deployed today. And I think sometimes people like to act as if integration is different from assimilation, that assimilation asks you to be completely absorbed and change yourself. But integration is a two-way street, you know, we take something, you take something, but, but the reality, I just think it is, is so different to that. Um, and and, it, and in, in a way, maybe it's, it's a way that liberal discourses have actually just adopted those more kind of overtly racist um, ideas. It, that reminds me of, I think it was Malcolm X who said, the only thing I like integrated is my coffee. Um, but that, that's really interesting what you say, because I think it raises the question of what is multiculturalism and what is multicultural Britain. Um, and I think it was around the turn of the century, the Parekh report came out, which said, uh, you know, it's widely hailed and it said Britain is both a multicultural society and a liberal society, and it sort of has to balance the two. And of course, the current uh, conservative project is to rail against multiculturalism on behalf of what they call a muscular liberalism. But do you think that this multiculturalism that they're railing against, so, so the pre-conservative government situation, was at all sort of satisfactory or, or is that problematic as well? No, great question. I, I, I mean, yeah, I think the, the direction that your question is leading, I agree with, which is to say that, you know, what, what we're talking about when we talk about multiculturalism was a very concerted effort by the British government from the late 70s, where from the, during the 60s and 70s and even the 80s, you have organized anti-racist movements of, um, you know, black and brown communities in this country who are often just all described as black, who were making demands that were to do with quite radical structural change, education, healthcare, policing. And as a result of that, you had the government say, mm, well, rather than making any structural changes, what if we introduce this way of thinking about anti-racism that instead co-ops those movements and says, well, what if we have more representation of communities at different levels. And it made concessions, which I think were then labeled as multiculturalism to say that multiculturalism actually is about, um, you know, the visibility of your culture or the, the uh, inclusion of learning about certain festivities or foods or whatever. But I think the question to ask to answer your question is, what material changes happened in people's lives. And if we can look at the 60s and we can look at today and we can say that it's the same communities who are marginalized, it's the same um, racial groups that are uh, treated the worst in healthcare, that are lose out the most in housing and in education, then I think we can see that multiculturalism didn't make any material difference. And if anything, it became a discourse which today part of that railing against it, as you mentioned, is, is also this very racist kind of narrative that multiculturalism allowed multiple cultures to flourish and in those the flourishing of those cultures those racialized people um you, for example after 7 7 you have this idea that multiculturalism clearly failed because muslims were allowed to be muslim in their ethnic enclaves right and so that kind of yeah you just kind of see that at every level actually not only did multiculturalism not have the material kind of um shifts that we would need for us to feel that it brought about justice and liberation it also then became weaponized against the same kind of groups of people that it was supposedly um good for that's really interesting thanks 
Um, so to talk specifically about Cambridge University now, um, this university has more and more Muslim students every year, which is incredibly positive. But even here, the sense of being under unusual scrutiny is often felt by people. So according to a recent student union survey of Muslim students at Cambridge, 60% said they regularly censor themselves and limit their participation in public discussions to avoid becoming objects of suspicion. And nearly 80% said they feel constant pressure to present themselves as a good Muslim in order to break negative stereotypes about Muslims. Now, you left Cambridge a few years ago, and when you were there, there were even far fewer Muslims. What was your experience when you were at Cambridge of being a Muslim minority in the university, especially as a visibly Muslim woman? Yeah, that's really interesting to hear those um, statistics and uh, I guess completely unsurprising. But yeah, I think it's making me think that part, so much of the experience of being visibly Muslim at Cambridge is how hyper visible you are, right? Because as you mentioned, there's so few Muslims. Um, and, you know, I'd come from a state school in Leeds where that, I'd never really thought about my visibility in that way and then arrived in a college where I was the only visibly Muslim person. And I think with that comes not only the scrutiny that you mentioned, but I think also the, the pressure that I assume the people who answered that survey are talking about where even though it may not be overt, you recognize that anything you say and do will be automatically ascribed to Muslims. And in a context, and I think it's important to add that in a context in Cambridge in particular, where many people do not know Muslim people, they haven't come from social circles or cities where there are larger you know, ethnic minority groups. And I remember when I, when I was graduating, one of my friends, um, a white man who went to Westminster School, um, he said, isn't it funny that you know, if you hadn't come here, can you imagine how many people might never have met a Muslim? And I think that kind of level of onus on each Muslim at Cambridge, that they may be the only Muslim that, you know, hundreds of people interact with, it, it is such a heavy burden to carry because it means exactly what those people feel, that you have to perform in a way that essentially, you know, protects Islam from, from the kind of racialized scrutiny that it faces and protects Muslim, the other Muslims that those people might ever interact with from being presumed to be criminal, violent, uh, misogynistic and I think it, it you know it forces us to have really bizarre performances where I remember you know almost in my head rehearsing the kinds of arguments I was going to make about something or the kind of answer I would make if someone asked me why I wore hijab or why this or that um and and, and the other kind of impact I think was just that you know anytime anything happened so when I was um at university I remember the Charlie Hebdo attacks happened um I remember a couple of other things and it was just like in every case I was the first point of call for, for many people who I didn't know who were just acquaintances not friends um which again I think puts a big political burden on you as a Muslim that you have to have you know you have to know what's going on in Palestine at all times you have to know what's going on in, in every kind of European city and I think that's yeah it's just heavy and I think I remember it being heavy I think on the other hand I do think it it politicized me in a way I wouldn't have had to be politicized had I gone to another university and I think that um, being under that amount of scrutiny meant I really wanted to know my stuff. I really wanted to know what was going on. And I think, and I, and I, you know, I take this idea from Bell Hooks, um, scholar and theorist, who kind of suggests that actually being in the margins, you develop a way of seeing that reveals or is able to see the injustices of a society much better. And I think being hyper visible at Cambridge, being in that because, because I think also it's important to say as a Muslim woman, I think you're simultaneously hyper visible and invisible, right? And I think so much of the Islamophobia that I faced was in that over um, kind of over surveillance, but also in the ways that, you know, you could just be ignored and invisibilized and erased and excluded and, and all of those things, which, you know, on a personal psychological level are obviously really difficult to, to manage, but also I think say so much about you know, is it enough for a university to simply include more and more Muslims? And how can that be enough in a context where they're, be, they're legally bound to also continue to surveil and, and surveil more and more and continue to scrutinise more and more? Um, and I think, you know, so Prevent became statutory during the time I was at Cambridge. And I remember very soon after it, if I'm not, yeah, if I'm not wrong, the Charlie Hebdo attack happened very soon after it in, in the following year. and. I was um, 
organizing an event called the politics of grief really thinking through you know why it was that we were able to so readily grieve um the deaths of white people in a, in a european city when that same year you'd had so many different massacres happening around the world and when I tried to book the room, um, that was the first time that I came across kind of the, the ways that Prevent was already working, where I was sort of advised kind of quietly that, you know, maybe somebody else should book the room in their name, who's maybe, you know, not, you know, it was all implied, but, you know, I knew exactly what was going on. And so I think, again, that was an example where it's like, nobody really cares what I'm doing until I'm doing something that can be linked to my Muslimness. And then now it's suddenly threatening and troubling. So yeah, I'm sure. Was, yeah, sorry that was a bit rambly. There's just so much I could say about the experiences at Cambridge, but um, yeah, I think it's it's a contradictory and difficult kind of, but yeah, example of Islamophobia in practice. But I think also one where if you experience it, hopefully it's a way to be politicized and a way to kind of really get to grips with how how systemic racism works. I remember saying, and I'll just end on this, that going to Cambridge helped me. I think understand more quickly than anything else what we mean when we say institutional racism because it's just it was so blatant and it was so in front of my face that I could see that this is at every level and every process and it's not just about bad apples right this is like something much deeper historical material and ideological so yeah well, that was a great answer thank you very much um did you I'm interested uh what about the academic context did you sort of feel the impact of this surveillance for example with the uh, supervisors it's a really interesting question. Um, I think I definitely felt at times I did have to perform um, kind of, so I'm just thinking about the kinds of papers that I, the, the modules that I studied and the kinds of the areas of research that I was interested in. And it is interesting looking back because, you know, I was looking at, um, at one point I was doing an independent study into the discourses between Islam and socialism. And I was reading Syed Fitlib in the, in the library and I was reading kind of, and, I think at that time I wasn't very aware, um, and as I say, prevent was just becoming statutory, but I myself wasn't very aware of the ways that kind of the um, the literature that I might be reading or the arguments I might be writing could be deemed themselves as suspicious because a result of me reading and writing them. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think I was lucky to have, I mean, some of the courses that I took are not available anymore and some of the lecturers that kind of created the space for, for example, that for me to be doing that independent study, I think don't exist anymore. Um, but I, I didn't feel it so much in that way, but what I felt more was that the, I suppose the philosophical foundation of, so I was studying history, the physical, but I think this is the same with other subjects, that the, the foundation of the kind of those subjects and the knowledges that they rest upon, the thing that I found most difficult was that they completely leave no room for, and in fact, I think really disavow religion, right? They're so steeped in secularism that I think even just to, to be religious and to, to kind of profess that you actually do believe in something other than just this world or you believe there is a creator, um, I think put you in a strange position academically because it, it sort of inscribes you with this backwardness, this unintelligence, this lack of um, enlightened, you know, reasoning and rationality. That you and, can't be objective or neutral as well. Exactly. And so I, I found that seeped into things where it was that, you know, I wanted to research the experiences of Pakistani women who migrated to West Yorkshire in the 1960s. This is the experience of my grandma. I was just like, this is something I'm really fascinated by. And at every level, it was, you know, so much of the work I had to do was really about proving that, this wasn't proving that, you know, I could, I could evidence this in rational ways, that I could evidence this in the way that history is historically written in this country. And so, yeah, I think it was much more to do with like the epistemological violence, I guess, of being, have, yeah, having to explain everything um, on those grounds. And I think it's something that since leaving Cambridge, I'm probably more able to see as well that the impacts of that and the impacts of always having to kind of prove cleverness, I suppose, um, in the face of your Muslimness, which is, yeah, I don't know, it's just a, it's a very insidious thing, which I think we don't really have the space to talk about. Um, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks. Um, now I want to look at an interesting experience you had with Prevent that I think perfectly illustrates the extent of the state's intrusion into Muslim civil society. So in 2019, I believe, you were contacted by a media company called This Is Woke, 
which presented itself as a company focusing on questions of identity for young Muslims. But this has work turned out to actually be something quite different from what it initially seemed to be. So could you talk us through that? Absolutely. So, yeah, so this is work. I mean, it didn't even present itself as a company. It just was a social media platform right, okay. that was supposedly for Muslim voices and, you know, ambiguous, something like that. But it could, you know, I easily was willing to believe it was just somebody, you know, wanting to put out Muslims in a different light. And they got in touch with me actually after the poem that you mentioned at the beginning, this is not a humanizing poem, went viral. And that was a time when lots of people were reaching out to me, so I you know, didn't really question it. And they said, you know, it'd be really great for us to make a video together or something like that. And then a few years later, it came out that far from being, you know, um, a grassroots social media platform, they were a home office construction. And what I mean by that is that within the home office, within the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, there's a unit called RICU, which is Research Information and Communications Unit. And their job, I mean, you, know, you can look up the research into them, it's very, very shady. A lot of their work is under the Official Secrets Act, so you can't really access it. But what their, their work involves is social engineering, basically, of Muslims in this country. And so that a lot of their audiences are what you call prevent um, audiences. So that means Muslims aged between, I think, like 18 and 35. And this example of This Is Woke is a great example of the kind of work they do. So they had contracted a, um, a private kind of media company to make what could seem like, to, you know, a, a grassroots kind of Muslim um, run operation. Uh, but actually what they were interested in was putting out what I would call propaganda. So for example, in the interaction they had with me, what they would have been doing, I now can kind of, you know, look in hindsight and say is, um, I suppose gauging how amenable I would be to be a mouthpiece for the kind of ideas that they want to put out there. So, you know, they've seen that you've had this poem go viral, people obviously listening to the narrative you put out. Could we give you another narrative that's actually more aligned with the state's kind of agenda to put out? And that might sound really dystopian. It might sound like, you know, we're not living in like communist Russia, like that sounds a bit extreme. And it, it does, but it is in fact very true. And Riku have, have been at the head of many other operations like this. You know, they've worked with, and it's not always that they're outsourcing this work as well. Like sometimes it's, sorry, it, it, it can be more complex. Like, um, so there was a, there's a case where they, um, they outsourced to another to another PR company to work with some charities in the UK um, under a, a kind of campaign called Help for Syria. And a big part of this campaign was actually to make sure that the way that Muslims in this country give um, financial donations and resources to people in Syria was through kind of government approved channels only because of this Islamic phobic, this Islamophobic notion that, you know, Muslims are going in aid envoys and joining ISIS when they go to Syria, which obviously is just racist, but it's interesting how kind of to the extreme lengths that they are going to, to engineer certain values of what is right and what is wrong amongst Muslims. And one of my, actually the most, I think, fascinating example for me of this was another social media platform called Super Sisters, which still exists, um, which when you look at that Instagram, it just com seems completely, you know, harmless. It's just a bunch of posts, you know, it's like different female celebrities and quotes about, you know, being happy and kind of self-esteem and this kind of stuff. And it just seems harmless. However, this is also a Riku project, right? So it was outsourced, again, Riku contracted another company to produce this. And what I was thinking about is how the social engineering here is so subtle because it's not, it's not about getting us to take on certain narratives, but it's more about inculcating a type of youthhood, a type of girlhood that is completely depoliticized. And so as an example, their Islamophobia Awareness post um, last year, uh, when it was Islamophobia Awareness Month, was said something along the lines of, you know, we are celebrating all the Muslim women who are CEOs, who are this, who are that, but it was completely didn't mention Islamophobia, right? No analysis of Islamophobia, and instead this very kind of superficial um, celebration of like the existence of Muslim women in, you know, positions of capitalist exploitation or whatever. And I think that to me, exactly as you said, proves that, you know, a lot of our focus is on prevent at the moment in, in the kind of uh, campaigning and organizing we can do around Islamophobia, which makes sense and is really important. But I think what we have to recognize is that prevent is already beyond prevent. <laughs> you know, like counter extremism is seeped so deep into other areas of the work that the government do that are much more insidious in a way because we don't see them as clearly. And I think Riku's work is a really good example of that because you think about social engineering, 
you can, you know, the, the kind of, if you take it to its logical conclusion, you end up with things like the concentration camps that Uyghur Muslims are in right now. That might sound like a, like a big jump to make, but actually it's not, right? Because people, uh, Muslims in China are being told that, you know, they have to strip themselves of the, the behaviors that make them Muslim, the actions, the names, um, and, and much more. And actually if we're in a context today where secretly our government is, is encouraging us to rid ourselves of the things that actually maybe are a religious duty upon us, for example, resisting injustice and say instead that it's important to have this depoliticized version of ourselves, then we're, we're on the road to engineering that is also about elimination. And that's the way I see it is that, again, that might sound hyperbolic, but I think that in, in any situation where you are trying to inculcate people with a way of thinking about their society that's depoliticized or that actively advocates for the, the status quo, which is violent and harmful and repressive, then we're already on a very dangerous path. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. It seems to be about the different ways in which the state tries to uh, speed up the process of assimilation, as it were. And it's interesting that you make the link with China, because, of course, in um, the Uyghur region in China, if you're a Muslim, many activities that will get you uh, sent to a concentration camp would get you referred to prevent in Britain and that's because it's the exact same framework and of course the government was actually promoting prevent in the Uyghur region in uh, 2007. Exactly. There, there are direct links there um, but I think uh, finally the final topic that I want to look at is gendered Islamophobia. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about how Islamophobia operates differently with regards to Muslim women and Muslim men, because this is something that uh, we often don't think about enough. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. I think what's important to note in the first place is that I think Islamophobia is, it, it actually in all the ways that it operates is inherently gendered. So I think we're encouraged to see Muslim men as, you know, Actually, the way I would put it is that we're always seen to be doing gender wrong. So either, you know, men are too patriarchal or they're paedophiles or they're, you know, a whole host of other things. And Muslim women are either, you know, oppressed and submissive and kind of too, too submissive again, or they're, you know, collaborators and they're actually too extreme and they're, you know, traveling to Syria and we've got to stop them all at the border and this kind of thing. So I, I think what's important within all of that is to recognize a, the ways that that kind of impacts Muslims ourselves in the ways that we think about ourselves, but B, the things that it justifies on a policy level. Um, and if you think about all the discourses, just as an example, that, that kind of rose up around um, the way that Shamima Begum was portrayed in the media in 2018 and since then um, to justify her citizenship being revoked, I think so much of that was a great example of how, you know, <laughs> the narratives about Muslim women simultaneously paint us as um, in danger and at threat to Muslim men, which becomes a way of, sorry, of Muslim men, which becomes a way of then justifying policing of Muslim men, over surveillance of Muslim men, but at the same time that we're dangerous ourselves, and therefore, you know, you see Muslim girl, you know, starting to wear a hijab at school, for example, is a, is a sign of potential radicalization. You might be at risk of radicalization. So I think that's a really interesting position that Muslim women are put in. And even if you trace back to the early 2000s, the beginning of Prevent, um, the early money for kind of counter extremism initiatives was split between the Home Office and the Department for um, Communities and Local Governance. And that segment of money went towards projects to do with um, role models for Muslim women, um, a kind of boosting Muslim women's confidence, this, these kind of projects, which then position Muslim women in this strange position of, you know, apparently being able to be the de radicalizers of the entire Muslim community but also needing em enough empowerment to kind of overcome this supposed patriarchy that is so kind of suffocating for us. And so I think all of these contradictions create a really, really difficult space for Muslim women, um, whereby I think anytime we actually wanna speak about the violence that we do face um, at the hands of the state or at the hands of interpersonal violence, it's just weaponized against us again and again. Um, and so I think that's really difficult because, you know, there are material situations we should be able to think about, like Muslim women in prison, the ways that they're treated are so specific and significant. Muslim women in immigration detention, um, Muslim women living in poverty. Muslim women also face those, you know, in instances where Muslim men are detained uh, in a family situation, if that's a father or a husband, oftentimes, and there's a great charity who do work around this called HUGS, Households Under Great Stress, 
you know, they they um, document loads of testimonies of Muslim women who are left um, in really difficult and traumatic circumstances as kind of, you know, in charge of the children, that their, their children, but in a situation where they often don't have any income coming in, their assets might also be frozen, they can't um, rely on public funds. Um, and we, what frustrates me is that we don't think this, we don't think of this as kind of violence against women specifically or a type of gendered um, injustice, um, but it falls on the hands of women. And so it, it falls on the shoulders of women, I should say. And in that way it is. And then of course, you obviously have all the discourses around hijab, around niqab, around dress. And I think what's frustrating here again is that I think a lot of liberal populations are willing to sort of say that what Boris Johnson said about um, Muslim women wearing niqab, this is all horrible, it's racist, but are unwilling to kind of see that when his rhetoric is put into policy, where you have hijab and niqab bans across Europe, um, that that isn't seen as equally racist, that isn't seen as, as a form, again, of intervening in, in women's agency over how they dress over their bodies and that kind of thing um and i think this you know this stems from colonial times where we see muslim women mainly as i think symbols to be weaponized either to to oppress or or to do what, whatever kind of intervene in, in muslim countries and uh, in muslim men's lives and so the ways that muslim men are gendered obviously justifies a whole host of much more overt i would say um police brutality against them so um, you know, home raids, detention, um, and I think it also justifies a lot of secret surveillance or so undercover policing, I think, with this idea that Muslim men are quite um, shady, you know, um, figures, um, and a lot of the narratives, again, that, you know, we put down, that liberal populations would put down the far right for this idea that all Muslims are members of grooming gangs, that, that's, you know, people, a lot of liberal populations would say that's, that's racist, that's not fair, but at the same time, continue to uphold these structures where actually all Muslim men are painted as problematic, all Muslim men are seen as threats. And the more religious you appear to be as a Muslim man, e.g. having a beard, e.g. the way you dress, um, the more likely it is that you're going to be you know, stopped under Schedule 7. We know, I think, that the percentage of, of Pakistani men stopped under Schedule 7 is sort of like overwhelmingly huge. Um, and I think one of the interesting impacts that I, I'd love to know more about as well is the ways that, you know, this constant surveillance, um, as I've just mentioned, you know, you've had this weird gendered effect where Muslim women have been targeted almost to like empower and become role models and this kind of thing. Uh, and on the other hand, Muslim men um, have sort of just been criminalized and securitized. And I think the long term kind of effects of that would be really interesting to think about in the sense of what kind of masculinities that inculcates, what kind of femininities that inculcates, what kind of people you can be in the world when, you know, you, you go through 18 years of the school system where you're treated as a criminal um, or you're treated as an accomplice to a criminal or as someone who is oppressed by those. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many things we can think about um, when it comes to gender and the gendered um, kind of impact of Islamophobia. But I think it's important to remember that, yeah, Islamophobia is always already gendered um, and so many of the ways that I think this come back just as a final point this comes back to the, um you know Edward Said's argument as well that so many of the ways that Muslims are gendered are also just ways of deflecting from problems in this society we've just seen you know um the police man who murdered Sarah Everard and raped her be uh, finally kind of held to some sort of limited sense of accountability um but what's interesting is that so much of gendered violence is ascribed only to Muslim communities in this country and we and, and I think again that's a way of kind of saying this country is feminist, is liberal, is not patriarchal, is all these things, and you outsource again all your problems onto Muslims. Um, and actually, who who loses out from that is every woman in this country who does face sexual violence, who does face um, any type of misogyny from from systems and institutions that are never held to account. So, yeah, there's, there's loads we can say about that, but that's the sort of just what comes to mind. No, that's fascinating, and of course, there's a there's an interplay between sort of the level of uh, state and media rhetoric and what happens in the street because by far uh, anti-Muslim hate crimes disproportionately affect Muslim women who are visibly Muslim because of uh, their clothing so that's sort of a tragic uh, result of Absolutely. the kind of rhetoric that Boris Johnson uses and uh, moral panics for example uh, around the hijab um, so anyway thank you so much uh, for coming on this was a really really interesting conversation i enjoyed it very much uh, really grateful to have you on thanks lovely to be here thank you for having me and yeah let me know if i can help again 
Thank you so much. And thanks everyone at home who's watching uh, and we'll see you next time.